Jackie, um, Liz Cheney is always pointed and she's always deliberate, but she has never focused so much of her public sort of rhetoric around Trump's criminality. Let me play a little bit more from this interview about um, what she thinks DOJ has to do about all that. I think that there are um, multiple uh, criminal offenses uh, that the committee, uh, I don't want to get in front of the committee, but uh, that we are looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's very important for everybody to recognize that um, when you are faced with a set of facts, when you're faced with evidence as clear as this is, um, and, and some have said, well, you know, we don't know what his intent was. Maybe he really thought he won the election. We actually know that that's not the case. We put on testimony that showed that he admitted that he lost. But even if, even if he thought that he had won, you may not send an armed mob to the Capitol. You may not sit for 187 minutes and refuse to stop the attack while it's underway. You may not send out a tweet that uh, incites further violence. So we've been very clear about uh, a number of different criminal offenses that are likely at issue here. If, if uh, the Department of Justice determines that they have the evidence uh, that we believe is there and they mm -hmm. make a decision not to prosecute, uh, I think that really calls into question whether or not we're a nation of laws. Jackie Alamany, this is the farthest that Liz Cheney has gone in saying we have put it out there. We have shown that he lost and he knew it. We have shown that the scheme was illegal and he knew it. And we have tied him to the violence. If DOJ doesn't prosecute, it calls into question whether or not we're a nation of laws. Wow. Yeah, Nicole, and I think we're going to be seeing a, a lot more of that kind of rhetoric from Congresswoman Cheney and other members of the committee at this point, most of their investigative work is done. They are now in the process of preparing the report. Uh, and we have been told by sources that there is going to be sort of a, a, a more of a, a pivot towards now making sure that there is consistent pressure on the Department of Justice to actually um, pursue and prosecute this case in the way that the select committee believes it should be, based on the evidence that they've found and based on the evidence that they have displayed publicly. Uh, Chairman Thompson had told reporters last week uh, that the, the department, uh, that the congressional committee is not yet in the mode of sharing information with the Department of Justice, but that would be done uh, along with actually sharing all that information, the transcripts, interviews with thousands of witnesses, all of the document requests with the American public as well, once the report is written at the conclusion of their work. Um, but uh, again, in the meantime, especially as uh, we're going to be seeing less from the committee as a whole, uh, and, and um, they're in their quiet period writing the report, we are going to see, I think, again, public pressure from lawmakers on the Department of Justice. Well, and Barbara McQuaid, some people, I think, had minimized the importance of whether or not the committee sends over a criminal referral. This isn't about the technical aspect of whether or not they refer Trump's case criminally. This is about whether or not they take a case to the country, that we have produced the evidence of his intent. We have produced the evidence from witnesses like Cassidy Hutchinson that you hadn't even talked to before we put her in a public hearing. And if you do not prosecute, it calls into question whether or not we're a nation of laws and rules. Yeah, statements like Liz Cheney's make uh, Justice Department prosecutors very uncomfortable because prosecutors are not supposed to act based on public pressure from anybody, most certainly not politicians, because they're supposed to decide cases based on facts and law and not political pressure. But they can't ignore the facts. And what the committee has done here is to present to the nation facts that do seem to demonstrate at least probable cause, if not sufficient guilt to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, that Donald Trump is criminally culpable here. I don't know that they've made the case for his uh, link to the violence at the Capitol, lots of good circumstantial evidence, but I absolutely think they've made the case of a conspiracy to defraud the United States by knowing that it is a lie that the election was stolen and pressuring Mike Pence to throw out the results nonetheless. That to me stri strikes me as the core of a very strong case. And I can't imagine the Justice Department can see that evidence and think that it is not 
advance a substantial federal interest to bring that case. Yeah, and I think Liz Cheney wouldn't argue that she's placing pressure on DOJ as a public official. She is herself a lame duck congresswoman. But to your point, Barb, about the strength of the evidence, and, and let me just ask you, I, I, I think what they're saying is that even if you were that deluded, quote, you may not send an armed mob to the Capitol, you may not sit for 187 minutes and refuse to stop the attack, you may not send out a tweet that incites further violence. It sounds like around the violence, she's looking at what the committee talks about as dereliction of duty. Is that actually a specific crime that you can charge someone of, Barbara? So it's not a federal offense, but there actually is a really interesting legal theory here for manslaughter, which federal crime, uh, federal law defines as uh, a death that occurs on federal property when a person acts with a reckless mens rea, a reckless mindset, or even gross negligence. And so Donald Trump, unlike most ordinary citizens, has not only a duty not to do something bad, he has an affirmative duty to take action to protect people. And so I think you could possibly put together a theory based on on the facts that Liz Cheney just, just, just described to make Donald Trump responsible for the deaths that occurred that day. That's incredible. Um, Tim O'Brien, you're the only person among us who's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donald Trump in a legal capacity. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that his delusions of, of sort of the authority of the presidency make him feel somewhat bulletproof on both the documents case, even though that is clearly intensifying maybe even nearing a point where, where he could face charges, as, as well as around the investigations of January 6th. But his, um, and excuse any, any images that come to mind, soft underbelly is his businesses. That starts today. Tell me how that's likely being received and, and monitored inside Trump world. Well, I think, you know, they're going to be very worried about Alan Weisselberg, because Alan was Fred Trump's accountant before he was Donald Trump's CFO, and he knows where all the financial bodies are buried. And I think they're worried about, about his testimony to the point uh, that they've already signaled they're going to accuse him of lying. And, and I think that that's a pretty extraordinary posture for the defense to take, because you know, Alan Weisselberg's goodwill in his testimony is going to be an important factor here. He is, he has, you know, in practice refused to cooperate with the Manhattan DA's investigation, however, or in theory, but in practice, he actually is going to have to cooperate because the nature of his sentencing is going to induce him to be truthful and cooperative. And um, it doesn't really behoove the Trump organization to alienate Alan Weisselberg, but they've chosen to go that route. And I think it suggests they understand how damaging he could be. And he's the wild card in, in all of this. I think, you know, Cy Vance, uh, Alvin Bragg's predecessor as the Manhattan DA, left Alvin Bragg a gigantic problem and headache that he should have resolved before he left office, because the Manhattan DA's own lawyers were very divided about whether or not to indict Donald Trump. They weren't sure. There was a, there was a faction in that office that believed they had the, the evidence they needed to indict him. There was another faction that didn't. And, and Bragg has, I think, subsequently backed away from that. But they've indicted the Trump organization, the business, and they've obviously, um, you know, indicted uh, Alan Weisselberg. And uh, Trump himself is not at risk here. I don't think the organization now is at the kind of risk it's going to be in the New York Attorney General's case, which I think is an authentically existential uh, risk for the Trump organization. Um, but Alvin, I mean, uh, Alan Weisselberg is, is just a humongous wild card because he knows things that go beyond what is in the purview of the court right now. Financial fraud for sketchy reimbursement of $1.7 or so million. But he knows a lot of other things. And I think one of the interesting dynamics to watch here is whether Alan Weisselberg starts to spill more than anyone expected him to.